Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. If you're new, my name is Saray, and I'm so excited that you're here because in this video, I'm going to walk you through how to use the budget workbook. Just for a little bit of background, uh, the budget workbook was something that I created in 2019, and I've felt that it needed quite a bit of a, a revamp just in terms of how um, I organize my finances. And the reason why I created this workbook back then was because I felt like I couldn't, I, I hadn't found a system that I could use as sort of a master budget, something that I could create maybe once and reference when I use other tools to build my budget. So if you've been following me for a little while, you know that I use the Erin Condren Petite Budget Book for my monthly budgeting. And this workbook does not replace that system. I will continue to use that because that is my, my monthly budget. But the purpose of this budget workbook is to act as a reference guide, a one-time setup. And when I say one-time setup, it could be a one-time setup multiple times a year, but certainly not every month. It's something that I use as a reference guide to make sure that I have every single component of my budget accounted for when I am establishing my, my budget every single month. So this budget workbook is really perfect for someone who's starting their budget for the first time or they are looking for a budget refresh. Every once in a while throughout the year, I do kind of have to relook at my budget from scratch and start relisting everything out because perhaps there might be some bills that are no longer relevant. Maybe I cancel some memberships and things like that. So I review my budget uh, workbook a few times a year, maybe once a quarter or um, you know, maybe twice a year or, 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 or so, depending on what my needs are. But certainly, um, definitely helps me to keep everything together and make sure that I don't miss out on anything. So I have two objectives for this video. One is to walk you through how to use the budget workbook. And the second objective is to really give you that introduction to budgeting. If you are new to budgeting, hopefully this walkthrough will help you to get started. That has been one of the questions that I received so often. So I'm hoping that this walkthrough will certainly help you uh, get going with your budgeting. Just a few logistics. So the budget workbook is an eight page printable, and this is something that's available in my Etsy shop. I'll go ahead and leave the description, the link in the description section in case you're interested in using this sort of format to get organized. Um, you know, I'll leave that there for you. So it is an eight page printable. I did include two bonus pages. So it's a total of six pages plus two bonus pages that I will go over. And then the size is a letter size. So because it is a printable, you can obviously download a copy once you purchase it from the shop and then you can download it as many times as you need to, or you can just pick out specific pages if you like as well. Maybe you don't need all of the pages at the same time every single time. Maybe you just need a few components. But the workbook is really broken down into five simple steps. I wanted to keep it as easy as possible and as simple as possible to understand because budgeting can be overwhelming and certainly there is a lot of information out there. So I will walk you through essentially five simple steps that are built in this workbook for you to get started. And also just in case I do have any questions, I would anticipate um, questions around what system am I using here. This is a disc bound notebook. This is from the Martha Stewart collection, which I found at like an office supply store, like um, Staples. So you can use that. I love the disc system, not so much for my planners, but certainly for notebooks and sort of loose pages and things like that. I love the disc for that. So I do have a puncher that punches for the disc size, which is from the Happy Planner. And, um, but you can also obviously get print it out and put it in a binder. It is a letter size, so it will fit really nicely in a binder as well. All right, so the first um, section is really how to use the workbook and it's very like high level overview and just letting you know that I've been using this for a while, just a very few simple steps that can really help me reset and reorganize my budgeting system. And right on this first page, you have the first step. So the first step in your budgeting journey is to understand your all of your income sources. So you have some space here to jot down what those are. So I have, for example, my work and the frequency in which I get 
paid as well as any extra income. Here I sort of kept it pretty high level but I would be a little bit more specific in my actual workbook or in my most current updated workbook. So essentially this is a workbook, the figures and all the work that you'll see here is actually when I did this back in September September or October of 2022, I pulled out the workbook and I sort of started working through my budgeting because I felt like I needed a huge budget reset and re-relook at. So the stuff that you'll see here is based on those numbers from back then. So I am due actually for a new refresh. So I'm going to be doing a new one in January of 2023 just to kind of reset myself up because some things have changed. But essentially, you know, you want to really break it down. So I would have like, for example, my Etsy income or my YouTube income as well, or any income from any affiliate links like share a sale, all of that stuff. So you want to list out all of your income sources. So this step is pretty straightforward. And then you have a, you know, a section here to, for you to write down what your totals are. This is important because at for every step, you're gonna have a total and you're gonna bring it to the last step, which is step number five. All right, so don't be intimidated by all of my notes. I'm going to walk you through all of these. So step number two, um, I know that it's labeled fixed expenses, but we're gonna walk through what I mean by fixed expenses in just a moment. So this section is where you want to start indicating all of your fixed expenses first. So I would start with that. So for example, I started with our mortgage, our HOA, my car payment, um, my gym membership, my hair color. Uh, I have a Patreon membership as well, life insurance, student loans. All of these things are fixed payments. So I know how much is due every single month and is due on a specific day. So then I wrote these down um, for the dates that, that were due and then the total amount that was due. So just wrote a note here to myself just to mention that the amount of these bills does not change. So our mortgage is pretty much the same. It doesn't change. Could I pay extra when I'm making a payment on, on these bills? Absolutely. So sometimes we do make extra mortgage payments, but I'm not counting the extra because that's not every single month. So what you want to capture here is what your typical expense would be that you can count on every single month. We're going to talk about the cash envelope system in a little bit more detail later on. But one thing that I would mention about these expenses is that typically these expenses we pay electronically or automatically. So these do not need to be part of the cash envelope system because they're coming out automatically out of our account. So why would we take the money out of the bank account in order to make these payments or in order, you know, because we might have to put it back in. So these do not need to be part of that. Those Basically, these expenses stay or this money for these expenses stay in the bank account. Some additional bills that I am including here that you would need to include here as well are some of these essentials. So even though they're not necessarily fixed, so for instance, our electric bill and our gas bill, those are two bills that are not fixed. But nonetheless, they are a monthly expense. So I want to um, account for these here. So there are variable expenses, but they're part of your monthly expenses. So you can include an estimated amount. So maybe take a look at your statements and see how much is your average payment for these bills. So for example, I just picked an approximate amount of $175 for our electric and $100 for our, uh, for our gas. So additional expenses that we want to include here in our part of our monthly are things like um, groceries, gas, dining out, uh, for me, hair and nails, and also miscellaneous. So I want to include all of these here. The reason why I have a little dollar sign next to these is because these would be great categories to be part of your cash envelope system if that's something that you're interested in in terms of managing your money a little bit um, more intentional. That is not to say that these transactions or these categories can be done electronically, but one of the changes that I made is that I started to implement the cash envelope system in which you basically take out the money that's allocated for the month for these categories 
and you have it in cash because this method gives you a lot more control over those expenses and these are things that I typically um, end up overspending on or uh, for example dining out that was a category that was you know really um, uh, had a, a major leak and, and it was hard to control so that's definitely one that definitely helps to have a little bit more uh, of a tight rein with um, with that particular category. So if you've been following me for a while um, or recently, um, you can see that in my budget videos, I've talked about my cash envelopes. So I have one for miscellaneous, I have one for dining out, my hair and nails, and I also have one for groceries as well. These are also found in my Etsy shop. The last item here is savings. So that is something else that you want to include as part of your monthly expenses. And you wanna treat savings as an expense because I think we're more likely to follow through with that savings if we treat it as an expense. And we also wanna pay ourselves first. So you wanna include savings somewhere in here um, also. Throughout the book, you'll have some additional budget tips. So for example, I mentioned here, if you have like a tithing or a given amount every month you want to include that as well uh, because of the number of expenses you might need another page so certainly feel free to print out another page if you need to uh, in order to capture all of those monthly expenses so you want to think about what is it that you spend money on on a monthly basis and you want to include them here and even though some things might be variable you can still allocate them to a fixed dollar amount by just picking out an average of how much you're spending in that category remember this is not going to be your monthly budget this is your master reference workbook that you can just capture everything and have it all in one place and give you a general idea you know am, am i spending within my means or do i have to take a look at some things in order to make some adjustments when i personally did this uh work i actually forgot at the time i actually i didn't forget so what i was doing is that i was paying all of my credit cards in full every month but because i was overspending i didn't have enough to go for other bills or i i i probably i had enough but things didn't weren't allocated properly so one of the things that I've done is that I'm focusing on paying down those credit card balances. However, I'm not so aggressive as to pay them all that, so that then I don't have any money left over for sinking funds, etc., which we're going to talk about in just a minute. So you want to include all of your credit card payments here as well as part of fixed expenses. All right, so that covers our monthly expenses that we've captured. So I... I have my total amounts based on you know the fixed amount and the the averages that I picked out for those and then I have my total down here we're now going to move on to step number three this brings us to sinking funds and there are two examples or two types of sinking funds there are high priority and low priority sinking funds the one that you're seeing here is the high priority sinking funds so these are things that are absolute necessities that are bills that come due maybe once a year, maybe more frequently at times. And they have, sometimes they have, a, they typically tend to have a fixed amount, but these are essential expenses that you need to pay. So for example, for us, um, so that includes our car insurance, taxes, homeowner's insurance, um, prime membership, that's an essential for us. Uh, property taxes, our water, and then I have some content things that I use that is essential I consider, and car registration, etc. So we have some things. So you get to pick whatever it is that you consider high priority sinking funds. You know, no one else can can tell you what you consider high priority, but typically those those bills. You know, for example, we have to pay our our homeowners insurance. So that's a that's a non-negotiable. So certainly that would that's definitely going to be on uh, the top priority for us. And then you're going to write down what is the total amount due for the year or whatever the, the frequency is. So, for example, for us, our um, homeowners insurance is nine hundred and seventy five dollars that is due in June and 
we're going to talk about these two columns in just a second. But one thing I want to mention is that all of these categories um, can be allocated in a cash envelope system or it can be allocated in separate savings accounts. It's definitely all personal preference for you. This is something that I am actually saving and using the cash the category as well, the cash category, uh, the cash envelope system as well, just because I have saved them in savings accounts in the past, but it just has gotten confusing for me. So I prefer um, the cash method because it just helps me to see that visual, um, the visualization for those expenses and it's definitely out of my account. There is no temptation of using it. And when it's physically labeled for a specific purpose, I'm less likely to give into temptation to use it if a an emergency <laughs> vacation comes up or something like that. Okay, so I wanna spend uh, some time just talking about these two columns over here. So this column is number of months until the bill is due. And then this one is the monthly amount or the bi-monthly amount, or you can obviously change this depending on your, on your situation. But basically what the idea behind this is, and it all, it all is going to depend based on your financial situation, is that let's say, for example, we're looking at car insurance. Car insurance would be due at for $642 and is due twice a year in April and October. We are in January right now. So let's say I had not saved any money for car insurance that it's due in April coming up and I need to come up with $642. What I could do is divide $642 by four months roughly that would be until that payment is due you can even do three months just to be safe just to make sure that you have the funds earlier sooner rather than later but i'm just going to use four for the example so we're going to do 642 divided by four months so that means that i would need to put aside if i needed to have that money i i want to have that money by april i need to put aside 160 dollars and 50 cents every single month and that'll guarantee that i have the funds there so that is if i divide by four months and you can certainly do that however i didn't do it that way for me because i wanted to have a fixed amount every single month that i don't have to change because let's say we get to April, now you've already paid that, so now you have to, you can reset your sinking fund at that point. Either way, it's no big deal. Um, but the reason why I went with the 12, the 12 months number in here is because I already have the sinking fund saved for this expense coming up this April from last year. Um, I had, or I've been following the system for a while. So I already have technically those funds. So I'm not going to pick four months from now. I'm just going to divide by 12. That way my number is consistent throughout the entire year and I don't have to reset or rechange anything um, there for me. So it's totally up to you. If you, you know, have the funds to be able to pay it when it's, when it's due and you can get away with just dividing by 12 so that you have that predictable amount, certainly, you know, that's, that's an option. But if not, just, you know, use the number of months until the payment is due so that you know for sure that you're going to have those funds available. Um, the downside to that is that if you have a payment that is due and it's on, of a larger amount, that's obviously going to put a, a bigger you know, uh, impact to your budget because now it's more money that you have to set aside up front. So that's definitely something to, to consider um, as well. But if it's a bill that you have to pay, you have to, you know, pay it either way. So there might be some sacrifices that are needed in order for you to make that happen. So then I have my monthly amount. So we were talking about our homeowner's insurance. So that brings us to $82 a month if I divide it by 12, which means I would need to set aside $41 per pay period because I get paid twice a month. And I think a lot of people do as well. But if you get paid you know, weekly and you want to do this activity weekly, then you would just take 82 and divide it by four. Or if you get paid monthly, obviously you just have the $82 there. So you can definitely adjust this as you need to, but that's, that's how I know like that this is, this is the amount that I need to take out in order to, to, you know, make sure that I, that I stay on track. Now, since I did this 
back a few months back, I've actually adjusted it for currently so these numbers don't look exactly like this one of the things that I would recommend is that you pick denominations that are um, if you're following the cash envelope system you pick denominations that are ATM friendly meaning you don't have to necessarily go into the bank in order to get the funds you can just get the denominations from the ATM because that's going to add a little bit more convenience it's already pretty um, it's a little bit more inconvenient to do the cash system that is for sure because we're in a very digital automated environment nowadays but from um from a an effectiveness standpoint if curbing spending is something that you want to do I think is definitely the most effective way that I found so far for me but I also want to keep it realistic and as convenient as possible so this is my high priority sinking funds savings as you can see I'm using the a personal size binder this system is actually it's a customizable system that is available in my Etsy shop uh, because of the supply chain uh, issues I do have very limited quantities of these but I will be restocking them as I get more supplies in so currently as at the time of this video there are very limited supplies but I do have more um, supplies coming and you know obviously keep an eye out an eye out on the shop so that you see every time that I that those get restocked and I'll mention that too in our in my Facebook group as well but this is the high priority sinking fund savings I am also doing a low priority sinking fund savings which we're going to talk about next and I also I'm going to have a savings challenge binder as well so this one would be the low priority sinking funds and then this one would be savings challenges so more to come on these but certainly if you're interested on you know kind of keeping a very similar system be sure to check out the the shop these are fully customizable you can pick um, to get the binder plus a certain number of cash envelopes so and they're going to be customized so you can let me know what the categories is that you're looking for and then um, you'll have a, a separate icon as well as some tracker sheets in the back to keep track of how much you've added to each of the sinking funds so as you can see I have quite a few here prime property taxes um, my content resources car registration etc absolutely loving this system I feel so much more in control and just so much more organized overall now we are on step four which is for low priorities sinking funds so these are sinking funds so those uh, savings that we want to make sure that we are accounting for but these are not as important and I shouldn't say that they're not important but they're definitely not the same level of priority that the other bills are because if you had to sacrifice something this is probably where I would start in terms of sacrificing what it is you know that that you can that you can go without so some examples of sinking funds might include and I included here an example like vacation um, other things for me include clothing that is not an essential item for me, but it may be for you uh, depending on your situation. So you determine what is a high priority sinking fund versus a low priority sinking fund. For example, um, medical, it's not something that I include in my high priority sinking funds for now because of our you know health situation, the, our previous history so I don't have any reason to think that that would change that's not to say I don't have like a medical fund or I shouldn't have a medical fund I certainly should um, but for me it's not as high of a priority currently that may change later on but at that point I can take a, a fresh look at my budget uh, makeup, household, entertainment, planning, and gifts, etc. So one of the things that I would recommend here is to determine how much can you allocate on a monthly basis after you've already covered your high priority sinking funds, all of your monthly expenses, how much do you have left over? Because then that's more of your discretionary funds. You don't want to set a goal for these and then realize that you don't have enough to meet that goal so that's something that I would recommend there so maybe you start with your monthly amount after you figure out 
okay, how much how much do I have left? And right, you, you have the totals here that you've been, you know, figuring out along the way. How much do I think that I should, that I could, I could allocate here? So, and then based on that amount, that's gonna give you your total. So this one was pretty easy because at the beginning I was just sort of throwing numbers uh, here, but obviously these have changed and, and will continue to change. But I came up with $50 per month for all of these. So that makes my annual goal, because I did 60, 50 times 12, that came to $600. Now, as I look at these, some of these might not necessarily be, um, you know, something that I want to do. For instance, maybe I don't want to spend $600 in makeup a year, um, although makeup is rather expensive. So maybe I will get to that number, but it's something to think about, you know, can I do with, can I do without, um, without spending that sort of money there? Um, you know, entertainment. Is that a realistic number or do I need to up it up a little bit? Maybe I do realize that, you know, based on lifestyle, that number is not necessarily realistic. So you want to take a look at your numbers and figure out what makes the most sense based on your current situation. And then the last step is just to bring over all of your um, numbers carry all of your numbers over so we started with the first step which was total income so I wrote down the total there that I figured out at the time um, I included here those monthly expenses what the total was there and then I added my high priority low priority so you're gonna take your income minus your expenses monthly minus your total high priority sinking funds minus your low priority sinking funds and what you wanna do is you wanna make sure that this number, this difference right here, it's zero. As you can see, when I did this, it wasn't zero. I was actually short by $343. So if that happens, then we need to go back and figure out, okay, what adjustments can I make? I can look back at my monthly expenses. I can start over here and see, you know, is there anything that I can do away with is there anything that I listed here as monthly fixed expenses or monthly expenses that I thought were essential but maybe are not necessarily essential um, can we cut back on certain things then I can take an inventory of my high priority sinking funds are these truly high priority for me or can I make some changes maybe not if they're everything is high priority you have to you have to save for them so maybe that's not something that you compromise there but then we come to the low priority sinking funds you know this is where you might have a little bit more discretion and say okay you know planning <laughs> maybe that might be a little bit uh, a high of an amount can i cut back on my planning supplies do i truly need to spend that kind of money is there any other way um that i can save some money there um, but, or the other option might be, how do I increase my income or, you know, I was selling something, it's more of a one-off situation. So I wouldn't, you know, that might not necessarily work, but what is something that you can do so that you have a consistent um, increase to make up the difference? But the goal here is that it's zero. You want to do a zero base budget. That means that every single expense from your mortgage payment or rent payment all the way to your daily cup of coffee it's accounted for. Every dollar has a specific name to it. And then I just added a few reminders here for your debt payments. If you have them, be sure to include those in the monthly expenses. I mentioned earlier that originally I did not include my credit card payments. So I'm definitely including those now because those are monthly expenses. That includes my minimum payment to all of my credit cards, as well as the one credit card that I am focusing on to pay off quicker following the debt snow the debt snowball method. That is something that I've talked about um, over on my Instagram. So if you want to check that out in more detail until, you know, until I'm able to do a video on it, a separate video or on my budget updates, I'm sure I'll talk about it as well. Certainly recommend you checking that out. But basically what you do is you pay, you list your debts from smallest to largest and you attack the smallest one first and in that order from smallest to largest by throwing everything that you can 
towards the debt and then when once you're done with that first debt then everything that you threw at that first debt is now going to be part of the payments for the second debt including the minimum payment so every single month that payment gets larger and larger so it gives you a lot of momentum then you also want to use automatic payments whenever possible for your uh, fixed bills so i mentioned this earlier here that not every single bill needs to be a cash envelope system this is something i've seen uh, other folks follow the cash envelope method and i'm of the school of thought that whatever works for you obviously works for you but i'm all about making it as efficient as possible and as effective as possible so i know that the cash envelope system works uh, for me but how can I make it more convenient? So it is effective, but how can I make it more convenient? And these payments do not need to be, for me, in a cash envelope because of the way that they get paid. The other thing that I point out here is that even those variable expenses that you might think um, could use a cash envelope, for instance, let's say gas. Gas is, um, and the reason why I put in the question mark here is because gas is one of those questionable, like, questionable expenses you know it's a necessary expense because obviously we need gas to get to work get to our appointments and get everything done that we need but if I think about it I'm I'll, when I get gas I'm never going to get out of my car and go into the gas station and pay with cash more 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 than likely than not I'm you know at the pump with my debit card just ready to get my gas and be out of there as quickly as possible so that is not something i don't have a, a a gas cash envelope all of my gas expenses i use my debit card for so think about realistically what will work for you if you're not likely to get out of your car maybe you have kids and you don't want to leave them unattended in the car even if it's just for a few seconds while you pay someone um, or it's the middle of a winter storm and you're trying to avoid walking away or walking uh in in the winter as much as possible so you know that might not necessarily be realistic so think about what are some of those realistic ways that you can still incorporate the system um into your into your process so that was my last reminder using the cash envelope system for high and low priority sinking funds for that physical representation of your savings so that said so pretty simple five step process to get you started with your budgeting i did mention that i included a couple of bonus pages within the workbook and that is one of them is the monthly bill tracker so this gives you a high level overview of all of your bills and you can use this space to check off as all of your bills get paid so that you know that nothing is late that everything is accounted for you have space here to write down the due date um, the bill that's due the total amount and then check off as you go for every single month the next um, bonus page is the sinking funds um, bill tracker so these are for specifically I use this for my fixed sinking funds, those high priority ones that I've listed on my on my step number three. And I listed here, what is the day that is due of the month, the name of the sinking fund, the total amount due, and I just put a little squiggly line for the approximate amount. Um, if I'm not, if I don't have an exact amount, like for example, taxes, that's definitely an approximate amount, but I'm, I'm, I'm making the best educated guess that I can. And then basically the highlighted months is just ex the month that's due. So for example, our taxes would be due in April and they'd be due typically on the 15th, give or take a day or so, if there is some sort of holiday involved. Um, our homeowner's insurance is due in June and is due on the 28th. And whenever that bill comes and I make the payment, I just go ahead and check that off. All right, you guys, so as I mentioned, this does not replace my budget. I still use my Erin Condren budget book. This is my budget for the month of December. And I break it more down in more detail for things that are specific to the month of December. But this really helps me to take a look at everything and make sure that I have accounted for everything and I know that if I follow these amounts for example if I if I did them correctly and if I did a zero based budget then I know that I'm not going to be 
living above our means and that we are spending money and managing our finances responsibly. So I hope this was helpful. Let me know if you have any comments or questions down below. Um, I'm always happy to, to assist if you wanna talk it through. I know every, every budget is so unique. Not two budget, budgets are the same. So certainly feel free to let me know if you have questions on how to get started. But I hope and it was my intent that this would help you to you know get started and have a solid foundation and reference system that you can leverage every single month as you build your budget. If you're new to my channel, I would really appreciate if you consider subscribing. I post videos every week. And if you've been with me for a little while, thank you so much for your support. Thank you friends for hanging out with me for another video. And as always, I will see you in the next video. Bye-bye.